Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. I'm also going to be at the Business Rocks Tech, Music, and Investment Summit recording shows live in Manchester, England, April 21st and 22nd, where Steve Wozniak is headlining. More information about the summit is on the show website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Robin Rath, co-founder and CEO at Pixel Press. Robin, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Oh, I'm very well. Yourself? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on the show and uh, a big fan of what you guys are doing. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. And to be fair, like I've kind of followed what you guys have been doing since you launched. So, you know, I'm kind of happy that, you know, I've kind of seen what you guys have been doing for at least, well, almost three years now, correct? Yeah, we're, we're uh, three years in September of this year, so approaching that, and we've done a ton of awesome things, and we have a lot of people like yourself that's followed along and seen the evolution of our products. Sure, but maybe before we kind of get into exactly what you guys are doing, let's get to know you a little bit better and kind of cover your background and maybe where you grew up. Yeah, definitely. So um, I grew up about two hours south of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, okay. in a town called, called Murfreesboro, Illinois, about... Uh, 10,000 people in that town, and wow. um, I graduated high school at the end of the at the end of the century, which sounds um, <laughs> <laughs> bigger than it is. Sure. Um, but I uh, I built we- I built websites in high school, and um, you know it was early days, so a little bit of HTML, not too many uh, WYSIWYG editors, and just kind of hacking around. Um, we used to trade baseball cards through websites and create a WWF at the time uh, websites to to um, highlight our our favorite wrestlers and really just had a great experience with that and then I also spent a ton of time uh, growing up playing video games um, you know started on the Nintendo the Nintendo 64 Sega PlayStation all that good stuff and you know that was my childhood was you know kind of growing up with the arcade kind of going from the arcade to the home and the internet um, coming to, to coming into be. Sure. No, no, that's awesome. So I, I'm kind of in a similar boat, right? Like I grew up kind of doing the exact same kind of thing, right? I wasn't building wrestling stuff. I was building kind of band fan sites. So yep. similar. <laughs> 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 but so I'm curious then, what did you end up going, taking something in university or, or what kind of got you passionate about kind of deciding to go into technology? Yeah, so my senior year, uh, my dad worked for a big company and he was uh, he had a lot of contacts and he found a guy who out of Neo Deche, Kansas, that needed a website. And I built a website for him, and he paid me eight, 800 bucks, and it was just fantastic. You know? sure. I mean, I'd never made that kind of money before, and I had a lot of fun doing it. And I was actually going into school to be an engineer, an aerospace engineer. Oh, and, wow. Um, halfway through the first semester, I decided that the creative side of the equation was really more my forte. So I started building websites at a faster pace, and I ended up graduating from St. Louis University in 2003 with a a degree in communication technology uh, where they were teaching things like Photoshop and Dreamweaver. And I was really kind of figuring it out on my own and they kind of were too. And I ended up, you know, taking advantage of the program and kind of building my web design career. Um, so I spent the next, you know, five or 10 years um, building websites and really just becoming a part of this community that's now kind of evolved into this mobile space that we're in right now. Sure. No, no, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you were doing kind of your own web work. What Mm -hmm. eventually, you know, got you to kind of start uh, Pixel Press? Yeah, so the first mobile project I did, uh, we were building um, concessions, video, and scoreboard apps for uh, executive suites within baseball and hockey stadiums. So very cool. I was working with the Cardinals. I went up to Detroit a few times and worked with the Red Wings, and we were leveraging pretty horrible Wi-Fi networks and trying to give these, you know, high-end guests a, a mobile experience on these devices that were still way before even the iPod Touch. And eventually that did evolve into the iPod Touch and we were building mobile-friendly websites for the iPod Touch. So that was my early days in mobile. And ultimately, uh, the, before I started Pixel Press about two and a half years ago, I was working for a company doing mobile application de- development for the Department of Defense. So we were actually doing some really awesome things with leveraging what now was some pretty complex technology between uh, the compass and the accelerometer and so on and so forth to leverage the sensor on the phone oh, to do interesting. very interesting things in the uh, out in the field, okay. um, satellite equipment, so on and so forth. And that's what kind of circled into what starting Pixel Press became. 
so okay. I can explain that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's that's yeah. really cool, actually. So uh, I'm curious then, what exactly is Pixel Press, and what was kind of the rationale behind saying like, okay, this is what we want to build and do? Yeah. So um, a big part of my story, like growing up in this kind of internet age, was that tools kept making things easier. Sure. I mean. It used to be really hard to share a video. I mean, really hard, totally. not to mention very expensive. It used to be hard to post a blog post, let alone a tweet. Um, photo sharing wasn't easy. Um, I used to have the, the concept of kind of a photo sharing website, but it was all in HTML. And I was, I and along with a lot of the people that I was working with, um, were really inspired by this. And these are people that I had worked with in the past, and including Josh Stevens, uh, my friend when I was growing up. And I approached them about this idea. It was inspired by some of the sensor work that I was doing within the Department of Defense around being able to take something that we did, as, which is kids, which was draw video game ideas on paper and use um, augmented reality or optical character recognition to turn those drawings into video games instantly. So we saw this opportunity where we could do all these things instantly, but kids, you know, they want to make video games. They want to build video games. Sure. And we saw this opportunity to, to leverage the simplicity of an, of an experience for, for uh, uh, the video game space. So uh, we, we set out and we uh, raised funds on Kickstarter to create a product called Pixel Press. The, the concept was very simple. It was draw your own video game. That, that's very cool. So I, I love that too. Like I think growing up, I think majority of kind of kids growing up that were kind of into this space always dreamt of or tried to build their own little game or, or something, right? And, and the fact that you're kind of bringing this to a whole new generation of kids, I, th I think is awesome. And, definitely, and definitely. I, the, the, you know, the, the maker movement is happening and, and it's happening now for video games across a lot of different areas. And that's, that's how we want to see kids as makers, for sure. Sure. I, I think that's really inspiring. So let's dive a little bit deeper into exactly how does a kid basically build their own video game? Yeah, so the, the first generation of our technology did do exactly what I mentioned. Um, you drew on graph paper, uh, you used shapes, um, so we called them glyphs, um, like a slash was a fireball, and a plus was a coin, and a box was a platform, and it was built around a very simple game mechanic that every kid knows, which is run and jump, sure. Super Mario Brothers gaming. And we saw a ton of success with that. It's been downloaded hundreds of thousand times. We've had uh, tens of thousands of games shared on the community and all of it's about letting kids get to that creation and share experience very quickly so there's a lot of great products out there scratch for kids you've got unity which is a huge game development platform these are great platforms for creating and sharing but they are heavily based in a lot of upfront work to kind of get up to speed um, but with pixel press and our products kids can share and build a game very quickly and get that satisfaction. And now with our newest product, uh, Bloxels, which I'll tell you about, it's actually much deeper in that now it's not just about building the layout of a game on graph paper, but they're actually using color now to create the artwork and ultimately the storyline of that experience as well. Sure. So maybe let's, let's actually cover what Bloxels is. I, I think that, that's kind of, that's kind of your, your new thing. It's kind of up and coming. It's very cool to me. So kind of exactly... Explain to somebody that has no idea what it is, what it is, and how you kind of use it. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'll talk about talk about the Pixel Press product floors, which you can download for free sure. um, today on the App Store. Um, it allows you to draw a video game layout concept on paper, yeah. take a picture of it with your iPad, sure, and then it instantly converts what you drew into the structure of a video game. So if you're familiar with Super Mario Brothers, you're jumping on a platform, you're grabbing a coin, you're avoiding a pit, you're fighting an enemy. These are all elements of a game that with Pixel Press Flores, you're able to draw that on paper. Now what we found was that um, we wanted to make something that is accessible to a broad range of kids. And we were seeing challenges with just the uh, meticulousness of drawing perfectly on graph paper. Sure. And we were also over and over again getting into saying, I want to create my own characters. I want to create my own characters. And for us, it re never really made sense to have them draw characters on paper with black and white, with pencil. Um, so the genesis of Bloxels, which is actually a physical toy, it's a game board. It's a gridded game board, so it is light graph paper, and it comes with eight different colored blocks, where now instead of a plus being a coin and a box being ground, 
yellow is a coin, and green is ground. And they're actually able to build the layout of the game on the, on the game board and then take a picture of it and turn it into a game. But they're also able to build the characters on the game board so they can use the colored blocks to create artwork and simultaneously build the challenge of their game, but also the artwork, and ultimately through the software, the story of the game as well. So how, okay, so it makes sense for me to use the little blocks in the board to, to build kind of the layout of the game, but how do, explain to me about the character creation. Yeah, so if you think about uh, a Mario game, it's a collection of assets. You have sure. rooms. Each room is comprised of ground, coins, fire, enemies, and so forth. And then each of those elements are comprised of artwork. And in most cases, especially with classic pixel games, or uh, classic video games, it was pixel artwork. And of course, with Minecraft, you know, a lot of people are very familiar with pixel art. Um, even today, it's very popular among kids. So essentially what we do is we have this system where it's an embedded structure of rooms okay. down to elements, down okay. to artwork. And when you're building these things on the game board, um, this 13 by 13 structure of our game board, you're actually building uh, 13 by 13 rooms, which can be a game as big as 169 rooms. Um, oh, wow. Each room can be 13 by 13 elements, so it can be 169 coins if you want, or if it can be a combination of ultimately eight different objects. And then each of those objects can be 13 by 13 artwork, where essentially the color represents anything from a banana to a safari guy to a flying pig. Okay, very cool. So... <laughs> so what, how did you guys kind of come up with this concept of, of basically building like a, I don't even know how to describe it without like telling people to go look at a picture. Sure. But. So that we have got this great graphic. We call it 13 by 13 by 13 by 13 explained because it is this embedded system where you're kind of like, you know, you always see those things in movies where they zoom you know, way out from the world and then eventually you see the universe and it kind of like just grows and grows and grows. In some ways our system's like that, but it's all based around this 13 by 13 structure. Right. And what it does is it lets kids overcome two big challenges that we see with video games. It's one, the technical challenge of building a, a, the, the level and the physics of a game. And then the artwork too. I mean, kids have a really hard time building video game artwork because it is such an open playing field. But with our system, we're really kind of democratizing the experience so the kids can focus on using the technical and artistic side to do what we all love about video games, which is tell stories. Sure. So check out the graphic because I'm going to send it to you and I hope you'll uh, post it on the website along with this. Yeah, I will for sure. So I'm, I'm curious though, so I upload all my stuff, um, then, then kind of what happens? So you're, you basically have a library and you have an editor. So as you create content, you're building your library. Okay. And you're assembling elements of your library into a game. Okay. And once you're ready, you can share that game to what we call the infinity wall where anybody can actually play your game. So that's the key part here is we're letting kids be video game publishers because they're able to actually build a game and share it within the community within our app. Very cool. So can they charge for the game or, or how does that work? Yep. So, there, so the app's free. Okay, um, yeah. The, the kit that we're talking about, the Bloxel set, which comes with 250 blocks, is uh, $49.95, and that's available uh, both on our website and currently in a couple of select retail locations. Okay. And what happens is when you share it, um, you don't have to pay to share it. No one has to pay to play it. But if people do play it and they want the assets that you created, they can actually buy them from you for coins, and you get the coins that they created, they, that they spent to, to get those assets. Okay, very cool. So I'm kind of curious to know, you obviously are, are tying kind of hardware and software. How, mm -hmm. What was it like actually building a physical thing that ties into software? Um, you know, people always kind of ask about kind of building a hardware kind of software piece integration. And so I'm curious to know how many kind of prototypes and, and whatnot and maybe just kind of walk the listener through actually building a physical thing and, and then going to get that manufactured. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's very satisfying, also, you know, really challenging in a lot of ways because whenever you're building something, especially software, you have the convenience of focusing on one thing. But when you're building hardware, it splits your team in two. And we're a small team. We're a team of seven. And, you know, we only have so many resources. So I will say that, you know, that is a challenge kind of going down both paths. But sure. the experience for us was um, kind of what you think about in the sense of, you know, you're prototyping. 
um, your fine tuning, your testing, and then ultimately you're sending that on to manufacturing. So we started off with a uh, with a machine shop based based in St. Louis that okay. built um, the the game board um, on a prototype level um, out of actually plexiglass, um, and we used a laser cutter to uh, build out the prototype. And we ultimately started testing that experience against our software, so recognizing the colors, making sure the alignment was appropriate, so on and so forth. And once we got that fine-tuned, we sent that off to uh, a manufacturer in China, which was recommended to us by um, someone that was an advisor to us, so that was super helpful. And we started the process of them building out a prototype and shipping the prototype over, us testing it, us making notes, going through that process. And that was about two to three months. Okay. And ultimately, once everything was finalized, um, they built a tool, which is the expensive part that cost uh, around $25,000 to build. Um, so and that can vary based on the complexity of your product. And once um, that's been built, uh, they send you kind of the final piece and you approve it. And then you're off to the races as far as manufacturing goes. I got you. So how much, so, like how accurate was, you know, the early prototypes when, there, when software was trying to recognize the, the actual board? Yeah, so we, I mean, we went through a lot of iterations on how big the game board should be. So I mentioned okay. earlier, we, we ended on 13 by 13. Because, so why was uh, that? Yeah, so we wanted it to, uh, there's a couple of components there. We wanted it to fit into a backpack. Um, we wanted the game board pieces to be um, not so small that they were choking hazards. Right. And ultimately, we wanted a middle point. So um, a typical video game graphic is 16 by 16. Um, but we wanted a middle point because we felt like, based on the artwork that you were creating, um, the symmetry of having a middle point on the game board was something that we over and over again saw kids wanting to have. So the most simple one is like building a Christmas tree, like building a Christmas tree on an even numbered um, platform is actually can be uh, a little bit annoying to do because of, because of the way that that uh, artwork is structured. Interesting. So did you actually test the actual board in front of a bunch of kids before or, or at what point did you kind of start showing them that? Yeah, we did a lot of testing very okay. early on. And we, of course, had the luxury of understanding how kids had worked with our previous products. Right. And had also a lot of teachers, a lot of classrooms, um, which we still work with today, um, very closely to test the experience and get that feedback. And we quickly saw that by eliminating the paper, we could um, essentially kind of count more consistently on what was being put um, on the game board or on the paper. Um, in that sense, and then with the color, we saw kids quickly uh, moving to designing characters. Okay, interesting. So, obviously, you got when you guys first kind of came out. I remember you guys got tons and tons of publicity, and obviously, you're doing well because you're 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 expanding and you're you're you know making the experience and making game creation and character creation a lot easier for kids. And I love the fact that you're still you know, getting user feedback, even when you obviously have a successful product out in the market. I think that's awesome. And I think that's important to kind of just reiterate. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've, we've done, you know, we have had a great history. We, we built Pixel Press Floors. We released um, Adventure Time Game, Game Wizard in partnership with Cartoon Network about a year ago. And what we found is that, um, especially with a physical product, you constantly got to be um, pulling in user feedback and iterating that product experience. And of course, we have a lot of ideas for where to take Bloxels next as a product line, and we need to be constantly um, getting that feedback to help continue to develop it. No, I, I think that's awesome. And I was actually just going to mention or um, ask you about Adventure Time Game Wizard. Like, what exactly is it, and what is the partnership with the Cartoon Network? Yeah, so Adventure Time Game Wizard is kind of the, the second iteration of the drawing on paper experience. Okay. Um, the first experience allowed you to essentially create um, one room of a game, whereas the Adventure Time game, uh, in addition to having the Adventure Time characters in it, allow you to build much larger games. And that's kind of was the predecessor to the Bloxels experience, which also allows you to build larger games. Um, but it's, uh, it's available on iPad and Android devices, um, phone and tablet. And it's, uh, it's a great product. It's, it's $4.99 on the App Store. And it's really deep. It's got um, the ability to switch characters. Lots of different power-up options, and the artwork is beautiful. So if you're an Adventure Time fan or if you just um, want to check out making a game or your kids do, definitely check it out on the app stores. Sure. So how did you guys go about getting a partnership with Cartoon Network? Yeah, so they actually found us during our Kickstarter campaign in 2013. Okay. Um, we, we launched our Kickstarter campaign in June, and about halfway through, 
um, one of the uh, biz dev guys with Cartoon Network reached out to us because Cartoon Network is, is known for being very progressive and um, just looking for new experiences to bring uh, to their intellectual property. And they felt like it was a perfect fit because um, at the time they were looking to get, get into user generated um, content within their systems and they've continued to do that today. So it's been a great partnership and we still um, love working with those guys. They're actually, um, we're at GDC right now and we're actually meeting up with them um, just to catch up and you know talk about the, the next steps for both companies. That's awesome. So what is GDC? Yeah, Game Developer Conference. Um, okay. It's the world's, world's largest professional game developers event. Um, this is the 30th year for it. Oh, wow. Um, and we're actually, I'm sitting outside of the Moscone Center where the the event is located at the Children's Creativity Museum right now. Nice. Um, yeah, we are. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting our inaugural Kids as Video Game Creators, our video game Kids as Video Game Makers 2016 event. Okay. Uh, where we're recognizing um, kids for being game makers with the Bloxels platform. Okay. Very cool. So, so how are you kind of recognizing them there? Yeah, so we, uh, we opened up a contest about two weeks ago uh, where we set out an objective, which is to create an original storyline with Bloxels, okay. uh, creating the characters and the dialogue and the experience within the game. And they were required to submit their game by March 7th, which was about a week ago. And we have since had our judging panel, which is comprised of some awesome uh, individuals from companies like Mattel, Cartoon Network, PlayStation, uh, Goldie Blocks, which is an awesome kids kids toy focused on girls engineering um, and we've got a couple teachers involved as well in the judging panel and they're helping us judge each game on uh, five criteria points okay and we selected our winners and um, they are going to be here to receive uh, framed artwork of their games uh, here at the children's creativity on uh, museum on Wednesday and we'll be um, letting people play their games while they're here that's awesome I, I think that's very cool of you guys to kind of promote the next generation of, of kids, right? Because I, I think like we kind of alluded to earlier in um, the show is that's how a lot of people get started, right? They, they build these little things or they play around or they, they kind of just like try to figure stuff out, right? And I, I, and I love that you're building these tools for kids to to do that, right? And yeah, the the inspiration is really important, and and again, having successful experiences for kids early on. Um, obviously, we're not trying to compete with you know Unity or in any way, and sure. the games you can make with this are extremely simple. But at the same time, I believe that these kids are going to have the uh, inspiration to go on and, and build with those tools in the future. Yeah, no, and I, and I think that's super important, right? And that's that's really why I wanted to have you on the show is because. Like I said earlier, as I've followed you guys for almost three years now, right? From the Kickstarter campaign, and then you know you obviously moved on to a successful partnership with Cartoon Network, and now with Bloxels. I I think it's it's awesome to see what you guys are doing, and I, I think you have like a real good product that that helps you know is actually solving a real need and problem, and inspiring kind of kids to do something great in their own time because it's I think every kid at some point probably wants to build a video game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the platform, you know, there's a lot of platforms for people to communicate out there, and obviously a lot of them are just not appropriate for kids um, at a young age. So we need more tools where kids can be expressive in a way that's safe and also um, important to them because sure. they need that reciprocal feedback. So video games is a perfect place because video games is the new rock star. I mean, totally. you know, Guitar Hero is a really cool product, and obviously kids still want to be rock stars to some degree, but now kids want to be makers, not just consumers of content. And um, doing that around video games, a platform that they understand, a medium that they understand, um, is just a really powerful way to connect with them and help them connect with each other ultimately. Sure. So I'm kind of curious to know, is there any real kind of big success stories other than, you know, the, the games you're just giving awards to um, that you have kind of would like to maybe mention? Well, I mean, we're, we're really early on in the life cycle of this product. We just released at the beginning, uh, uh, the middle of January. But we had, okay. an amazing, uh, we had an amazing toy fair. Um, we went to Toy Fair in New York about a month ago. And um, we have a lot of really good things going. Uh, we're currently in all Marbles the Brain stores. Uh, oh, wow. Congrats. Which, uh, That's awesome. 
Yeah, they have 35 locations throughout the U.S., and we're featured right there in the front window, and we're, not, we're one of their top-selling products right now, which is really exciting to see. And we've really just had um, a, lot of, a lot of engagement from our early adopters with our platform, and we're constantly taking feedback from them and looking to improve it. So um, we've got some really big, really big plans, but so far with this limited release, um, we've had just uh, a huge amount of sales and engagement around the limited inventory that we have, and we're looking to grow that throughout 2016 and beyond around the Voxels product. Sure. So I'm curious, though, how did you guys go about getting in physical stores? Yeah, so it's a lot of phone calls to get started with, and um, obviously um, trade shows and things like that are really helpful to get the, get the um, knowledge out there. So we actually announced... Uh, Bloxels last year at Toy Fair, and we were uh, recognized by Popular Science as the top toy at Toy Fair. And this was literally about a month into development and early prototype st stages, but that got a lot of press for us. And we've slowly built that momentum to the point that we are at now. Um, but at the same time, we're taking it slowly. I mean, it's really dangerous to kind of rush to be to have these huge partnerships with the large retailers because you need to have the volume and the manufacturing and ultimately the experience and the brand recognition worked out so uh we're we're being careful about that we ultimately want to, to grow a huge experience around this um, but we want to do it in the right way sure I, I think that's actually really good advice that you guys because a lot of people would just be kind of freaking out and trying to do whatever they can to grow as fast as they can and i think it's really smart of you guys to just kind of almost like back up a little bit, kind of look at it objectively and say, okay, we want to make sure that we make the right decisions instead of just kind of rushing to get whatever sure, you can, sure. right? Yeah, I mean, physical plus digital is really hard too because um, you've got to have relevance of both the physical experience and the digital experience. And, you know, we've learned we don't have it perfect yet, um, but we know what we need to do to fix that. Um, and we've we've collected that data and we've, uh, we've come up with that game plan based on research. So, you know, we have people who love the physical part of the experience. We have some people that say, you know, I don't understand it or I'm not really sure exactly how it fits in. And we need to, to fix those things and ultimately do that before we are at major retail. And once, we're, once we have those things figured out, then we'll be ready to go there and, and we'll make a much bigger impact um, by taking it, you know, in a very smart, strategic way. Sure. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and then... You know, every year Android and iOS come up with a new version, and you got to think about that from the software side as well. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, to our benefit, you know, these these products, their processor speeds, their camera quality, their connectedness is constantly improving, and that's what's made a product like ours even two and a half years ago be possible. Um, a product like this just wasn't possible before. And now as things develop, you know, you've got to stay up with the trends, but you've also got to focus on your product experience um, as well and make sure that it's kind of staying in line with what people want. Sure. So I'm curious, is there anything that you kind of thought would be pretty easy that was really difficult when kind of building either from the software or the hardware side? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll go back to the integration of the two. I think getting that play pattern right. And sure. you know, play pattern is a very kind of toy-based comment, but it kind of exists with whether you're using Uber or whatever, you know, there's a play pattern to it. So for and people think, that don't know what that is, do you want to maybe just explain that? Yeah, definitely. So play pattern, you know, the user experience, right? It's like sure. when you're, you pick up an Uber, how quickly does it come? You know, how does the money get transferred, so on and so forth? That, that process... Um, had to be fine-tuned before it really started working for them. And we're working to fine-tune that for ourselves as well. And I, I guess the word of caution that I'll give to anyone who's thinking about getting into this physical digital space, especially if you're coming from the software background, is that it does add this, it kind of throws this wrench in the complexity. Um, so when you have a small team, which most of us are whenever we're building startups, um, you've got to acknowledge um, where some of those challenges are going to be and make sure you're prepared to be patient and take those on, you know, one step at a time. Um, you, in a lot of ways, we, we started Pixel Press and launched Floors and, and thought that would be the be-all, end, be-all, end-all experience. But ultimately, we learned that there were some user experience challenges and there were some monetization challenges around it, too, um, that we had to figure out. Um, the App Store is a challenging space, and um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to be, you know, to build your entire revenue model around physical or digital products, especially whenever you're, you're looking to sell to kids. So you've got to, you've got to be comfortable taking your time and figuring out some of those challenges. Sure. I, I think that's, that's really good advice. I, I'm curious to know, do you have any advice on kind of the manufacturing side and, and working with somebody, I'm assuming overseas to get 
that actually build? Yeah, I mean, I think a, the best place to start is to get a really strong recommendation towards to an organization. Um, it's easy to think that like the biggest challenge is going to be communication, but ultimately, like that's actually not the hardest part. I mean, the people that I work with, I talk with them on Skype. Um, they speak amazing English. Like that's not the challenge. I think a lot of it's about the back and forth and just the fact that the timelines you set, you know, can change based on different challenges that come up. Whether it be um, the product, you know. Uh, the touch isn't right or the packaging isn't right. Like whenever you're sending stuff across seas and back and forth, um, things can take a lot longer than you thought. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, did you have to go, I'm like, I'm assuming you got it made in China or something? Yeah, it was. It was manufactured in uh, Shenzhen, China. Um, okay. we, we fortunately had a partner that went over there on our behalf on a okay. particular occasion. Um, and I, I think it's a best practice to do that just to make sure that uh, the pre-assembly what they call the build out where they're actually putting the final product into the packaging and assembling ed- everything together. I mean, they're going to re- be in our case, they repeated that essentially 10,000 times. If that's not done right, then you're going to get a bunch of stuff that didn't get assembled. Right. Um, so in our case, we had someone over there who set up a Skype call with us and he was kind of a third party that just made sure that everything was um, up to the standards that we set for the, for the final pack out. No, that's awesome. And then obviously you, in, in my opinion, anyway, you guys were probably one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns ever. And, <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Like, you guys, like, got tons of publicity went for it, right? Yeah, we did. I mean, we had our own, own hiccups, and obviously a lot of people do. Both sure. products were delivered, you know, three to six months late. Um, we didn't deliver on every aspect of the software as we had planned, and in some cases we rolled stuff into to other products, which is is a lot to do with just the fact of we got to keep the lights on and keep going, sure. too, because everyone wants us to build the experiences. But at the same time, like, it is such an uh, awesome experience to have people validating that, um, they believe in what you're doing. And for the most part, everyone's there to, to cheer you on in that way. And we, we really appreciated that and ultimately can never thank everyone enough for, for being a part of that experience with us. Sure. No, I, I think that's awesome. But what I was going to ask you is I'm curious, is there any tips out there that you have that you guys did certain things to help kind of get your um, you know Kickstarter campaign almost like above everybody else's. And I, I get that, you know, things have changed since you guys sure. ran it, but is there any kind of tips for people out there? Well, yeah, I mean, you got to be in it to win it. I always recommend people kind of believe that they're going to they're gonna raise the full amount on the first day and, okay. and try to create an experience to do that. And we didn't do that, and very few people do. But it's not... It's not something that you should go into lightly. You need to build the database of contacts, whether it be press or backers beforehand. Uh, you need to make sure your message is on point and make sure you get feedback from people to make sure that message actually resonates with them. In our case, you know, draw your own video game resonated very quickly sure. um, in a very viral type way. And ultimately, you got to keep the, the excitement up. You've got to be authentic. Um, I don't know that we did it too much differently than the people that are successful, but ultimately... Um, it is a lot of work, and you've got to be prepared and um, ready to make the most of those 30 days. Sure. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, it, I've heard this a couple of times now is you need to be really prepared, like you just kind of mentioned, before you go to Kickstarter. And you almost have to – like Kickstarter is almost like the last way to validate your idea. You've, you've validated maybe like 80 90%, and Kickstarter is kind of maybe that last 10 or 20%. You know, and, and those seem to be the most successful campaigns or the ones, like you mentioned, that have kind of done their homework and they've done their research and you kind of are ready for that kind of final push to, to put it to market, right, and get those backers. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's only getting harder. Kickstarter becomes more noisy. Um, there's new challenges as far as, you know, what people expect out of it. So um, it, I like your analogy about the last 80, 90 percent. I mean, it's like it's getting people to put down the cash, but it but everything else should be worked out and they should be, it should be almost turnkey um, to have a successful campaign um, anymore. Sure. I, I think that's, that's great advice, but uh, Robin, we're kind of running out of time. So I'm curious, well, not curious. Let's close the show with maybe again, kind of promoting exactly what you guys do um, just for anybody that's kind of tuning in late and where they can find you online. Yeah. So um I am the CEO of Pixel Press. We make a product called Bloxels that allows kids uh, to build their own video game. It's a toy 
that helps them get over the technical challenges and, and the artistic challenges of making video games by allowing them to build them with physical blocks on a game board and then turn those digital assets um, into a video game by taking a picture of them. So it's very simple. And ultimately what they're doing is they're creating and telling stories through video games and they can share those with their friends. Um, you can learn more about it at bloxelsbuilder.com. You can buy it on our website. Um, we're also currently available in uh, every single Marbles the Brain store across uh, 35 cities here in the U.S. Awesome. Well, Robin, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your busy day. Enjoy San Francisco, and I, I look forward to kind of uh, following you guys along. Yeah, definitely. Kevin, I encourage you guys to check out our Kids' Video Game Creators Contest. Um, it's bloxelsbuilder.com slash k. BGM 16. Um, we're awarding uh, three kids uh, the, for building some amazing games um, with Bloxels, and that'll be out on Wednesday. Perfect, Robin. Thanks again for doing this. Right. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kevin. All Take right. care. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening to the show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com. Until next time, keep building the future.